Well, hello and welcome to Powerhouse Church. <laughs> We're so excited that you are joining us this evening. And before we start, we are going to go into Mark 14. I lied, Mark 16, 14 through 20. And it says, later, Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples themselves as they were reclining at the table. And he called to them to account for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen from death. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed in me and has been baptized will be saved from the penalty of God's wrath and judgment. But he who has not believed will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will get well. So then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord was working with them and confirming the word by the signs that followed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, so much for your word that brings truth and life. We thank you that you already sent your son Jesus in order to go before us, to show us the way, to give us a hope and a purpose and a future, Lord. We thank you that you are the one who opens up our eyes to see and ears to hear what the spirit of the Lord has for us today, individually and collectively. We soften our hearts before you to see you, to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening. Welcome to Powerhouse Church. We're so glad that you chose to spend part of your Sunday here with us. And if you're watching online, thank you so much for tuning in today. We've just had such a wonderful time over the last few weeks as we have been in a series that's called The Resurrection that we started with Palm Sunday is Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem where they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who came in the name of the Lord. And we continued on through Black Friday and through when Jesus hung on that rugged cross, when he paid the price with his blood for the sins of the world. And then there was Resurrection Sunday where we celebrated that our Savior had risen from the dead, that the tomb was empty. And we learned last week the importance of the tomb being empty, that if the tomb was not empty, we're still in our sins. But because Jesus rose from the dead, our faith is in him, and that we can believe because he was raised from the dead as the first fruit, that we will be the second fruit, that in Christ Jesus, we will never die that we will go from glory to glory. Amen? What a beautiful time for us to walk through this story where we see the accumulation of what God had promised to give to us, that he promised to give us a Savior who would save us. And we celebrated that in such a beautiful way as many gave their life to Jesus and many were baptized. And then last week we talked about after the resurrection, we talked about where is Jesus. And so we posed this question last week because as Peter went to the empty tomb, he saw that there was nobody in there. All he saw was grave clothes neatly folded upon and Jesus was missing. We learned that Jesus, who was not in the tomb, we said he was here, that he was there, that he's everywhere. That we learned last week that Jesus is in the heart of those who believe in him. And so last week we talked about this story as two men were on the road to Emmaus. Two men who were followers of Jesus Christ. And that Jesus started walking with them. But for them, they thought he was just some guy who was going the same direction that they were walking in. 
they did not know that it was Jesus. And so Jesus, as he was walking alongside them, he was listening to their conversation. That They were still talking about all that happened. Their sadness was unmistakable. That they all were sad that Jesus died. That they can process this. That Jesus was supposed to save all of them. But now he's dead. They were thinking about what could have been. They may have been even thinking about how they could have prevented Jesus from dying. But ultimately, these men missed Jesus. And they were dealing with their grief that he was gone. Well, after Jesus listened to more of their conversation, he decided to ask them a question in Luke chapter 23, verse 17. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? I mean, why would Jesus ask a question that he already knows the answer to? Because he wanted to encourage them and also correct their theology. I mean, he knew exactly what they were thinking. But Jesus played this role so that he could rebuke them and ultimately reveal himself to them. So the two men responded to Jesus in verse 18. One of them named Cleophas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? These two falls of Jesus were stunned that this man had not heard about the breaking news that Jesus was crucified. I mean, everybody knew about it, and everybody was talking about it. But Jesus, pretending to be curious, asked them what things were they talking about. So they decided to give Jesus a little history lesson about himself without knowing it was Jesus who they were talking to in verse 19. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, a powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. They, they said the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since this took place. See, these verses explains their sadness. They loved Jesus and they were brokenhearted that he was dead. And the fact that he would not be able to redeem Israel. And so now all was lost from their perspective because he was dead. I mean, how can a dead man save anybody else? Because obviously he couldn't save himself. But what's interesting about all of this is that neither one of these men remembered all that Jesus had taught them. That he would have to be killed and that he would rise on the third day. Nor did they remember what they learned from the Torah and from the prophets. That they were taught all of this. But through their grief... Through their sadness, they forgot everything that they had learned. All they knew is the one who they thought was going to save them failed. See, as I thought about this, is we all go through negative circumstances in life, right? We all go through things that makes us sad, that gets us down, whether it's a loss of a loved one, whether it's a bad diagnosis from the doctor. Like, we all go through things. So similarly, these men are going through something like that. But what happens when we do, we find ourselves isolating ourselves from church. We find ourselves not being in fellowship with other believers. But somehow that's naturally what we do. Instead of moving closer to the church, instead of praying more and, and coming closer with other believers, asking for prayer and support, we kind of stand away. And this is what these men were going through. They were probably doing the exact same thing because of their sad and their grief. Because what's interesting is when we go through something, it's like the very thing that we need for our own well-being, we choose not to do, right? Like we know this will help us. But instead, nope, we don't answer our phone. We just kind of isolate ourselves by ourselves and just kind of be sitting in this grief all alone. So these two men who were walking, they were probably feeling the exact same way as we feel when we go through something. 
And so Jesus knew that they needed some encouragement, but they also needed some correcting in their thinking. So Jesus did what a loving God would do. He took the time to teach them the word of God in verse 27. It says, then beginning with Moses and throughout all the writings of the prophets, he explained and interpreted for them the things referring to himself found in the scriptures. You see, they needed this because their pain and suffering, it was making them difficult for them to remember the promises of God. How often do we do that, right? When we're hurting, when we're suffering, we forgot all the promises that God has promised to us. So what was happening is their emotions were overriding their spirituality. Well, after a long day of traveling on this road, these men decided to turn in for the night. But because this stranger, so they thought, kind of poured out themselves, give the scripture to them, they, they made a new friend. And what they did is ask him to join them as they turned in for the night. But little did they know that the stage was set. The stage was set because now God had opened up their their hearts. He wanted to open up their minds as well. And so as Jesus turned in with them, we go to Luke chapter 24, verse 30 and 31. It says, and it happened as he reclined with them that he took bread and blessed it and break it. And he began giving it to them. I love this part. Then it says their eyes were suddenly opened by God. And they clearly recognized him and he vanished from their sight. We learned last week that when we draw closer to God, God draws closer to us. But in this situation, it wasn't just spiritually, but Jesus came near to them physically, and their eyes were opened. As they saw his nail-pierced hands, they saw their risen Savior. Well, after being completely surprised and blown away by Jesus, I mean, what would their response be? How would they respond to this awestruck, amazing encounter that they just had? Well, we're told in verse 32, It says that they said to one another, were not our hearts burning with us while he walked and talked with us on the road, opening the scriptures to us? See, we can't have an encounter with Jesus and stay the same. That the truth of God's word had turned their frowns upside down. They went from being completely discouraged to joyfully encouraged. And as I thought about this, they they began their journey when all hope was lost. And then hope decided to walk with them. And then hope revealed itself to them. And when they broke bread, they realized this was Jesus. This was their hope, that he wasn't dead, but he was alive. What God wants us to know, church, is that the hope of glory is Christ in us. And God is calling us to bring hope to the hopeless. With these two men whose hearts were now burning, I mean, they couldn't keep this great news to themselves. That they decided they would go and share this great news to all the other disciples. And again, the question of last week's message was, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus because the tomb was empty? And again, We realize that he's here, he's there, but he's everywhere, specifically in the hearts of those who believe in him. See, the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross took care of the penalty of sin. But when he rose from the grave, he took away the power of death. While on the front end, it looks like Jesus was finished because that's what he said on the cross. In all actuality, he was just getting started. And see, Jesus, who is the object of the faith of his followers, has now been renewed. And these events would make their faith even stronger than it was before. Last week, we learned that the purpose of the written word is always to lead us to an experience with the living word. Because when we do, we will share with others because we've been changed by it. 
See, when Jesus said it was finished on the cross, again, he was speaking about the power of sin. And when he rose from the dead, it took away the power of death. And so now he's preparing his apostles to continue the work that he started. And so we're going to conclude our series today on the resurrection of Christ as we go into this final phase. See, last week we, we kind of talked about the empty tomb and where was Jesus. We're going to continue this pathway down in the end. And so the title of our message today is The Great Commission. That there's something that Jesus has called each of us to do and corporately do from the church. And so today we're going to talk about the Great Commission and the extension of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we need you every moment of every day. It's so refreshing, Lord, as we go back through the scriptures, Lord, to see the, the wonder that the disciples had and apostles had as they saw you, Lord. Father, would you let your word become real to us today? Would you open up our minds, God, that we can have a visual on what's being proclaimed? God, we thank you that your word is truth. And so, Lord, we can believe everything that's in it. So, Lord, I just pray right now we block out our thoughts and distractions over anything else, that we would focus on your perfect word, because faith comes by hearing and by hearing of the word of God. So, Lord, we give you the praise and glory and honor of the work that your word will do in each of our hearts today. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one day... Jesus will rule and reign in his millennial kingdom. This will be a 1,000-year reign as told in the book of Revelations. This is when the city of Jerusalem will come down out of heaven, and it will become the capital city of the new earth. That Jesus is going to rule and reign on this earth. And what's awesome is, is that his church his, his believers and followers are going to rule and reign with him. And so as I was thinking is about the resurrected body, what will our bodies look like? I mean, how will we move and have our being during this millennial time? I'm bringing that question up because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. Jesus is now in a glorified body. And so as we journey through the rest of his time while he was on the earth, I think we can look to a time, as the word says, that when we see him, we will be like him. And so we get a clue and a detail of what Jesus' resurrected body was like after he rose from the dead. And so last time, we were talking about the men who were on the road to Emmaus, who's recently had their eyes opened by God. And they knew for sure that Jesus is the Christ, that he truly has risen from the dead. But again, as soon as they recognized him, he vanished from their sight. They were so excited because they heard rumors that he was. They heard some people saying some things over here. But now they knew for themselves that this was true because they got to verify it with their own eyes. So they rushed to town to tell the other uh, apostles this great news. I mean, we've all heard the saying that God is never late, but he is always on time, right? God continues to prove that in this story. Because this would hold true with these two disciples who saw Jesus on the Emmaus Road. Because they would begin sharing their testimony and encounter that they had with Jesus with the rest. And so the apostles and the other disciples of Jesus are now together. They're hearing the good news that Jesus has indeed risen from the grave. I mean, this had to be one of the greatest moments of their lives. Can you imagine the joy? Can you imagine the tears flowing? Like, he really is risen. No, I'm serious. He really is. I saw him. Oh, my gosh. This is what we heard. But now it's like it's really truth to them. It's resonating that this is what really happened. And so we're going to pick up this story right where we left off last week. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24, and we're going to start with verse 36. 
It says, while the two were telling them this, the Lord himself suddenly stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were terrified, thinking they were seeing a ghost. As this party and celebration was going on, like, he's risen, so excited, a surprise visitor joined them. Jesus appeared out of nowhere. I mean, he didn't knock on the door and say, hey, guys, it's me, let me in. Jesus either supernaturally went through the walls or he was somehow transported inside the house. All of a sudden, they hear the words, peace be with you. Jesus was known for saying this. But instead of them recognizing his words, they were terrified because they thought they were seeing a ghost. See, Jesus looked the same, but he also looked different because he was raised from the dead. He possessed a glorified body. And so Jesus responded to their fear in verse 38. He says, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Well, Jesus, it's not every day that someone just appears out of nowhere. I mean, we were just talking about the fact that you rose from the dead, but you almost gave all of us a heart attack with this stunt. Since everyone was still in shock, they could hardly believe what their eyes were seeing. And so Jesus wanted to prove to them that it really was him. And so he continued in verse 39. He said, look at my nail-pierced hands. Look at my nail-pierced feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies. As you see, I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. In their fear and thinking that he was a ghost, Jesus took the time to show that it's really him. So he encouraged them to look, to touch, to feel, to see, because they knew Jesus was crucified. They knew that he had nails driven through his hands. And they got to hold him to see that he wasn't a ghost but had a real body. One of the things I want us to point out about this story about Jesus, because we just said he has a resurrected body, which is supposed to be perfect, right? But a body that has nail-pierced hands and feet and scars, that's not perfect. See, one day we will be perfected. One day Every hurt, every pain that we have will be gone. Those who are in wheelchairs will be able to walk. Those who have a mental disability will be divinely healed. Those who are hurting in any kind of way will be perfected. And as I was processing this fact, there's going to be one person in heaven who's not going to be perfect, and that's Jesus. That for all of eternity, Jesus will have the nail-pierced hands. He'll have the nail-pierced feet. He'll have the hole in his side because that was the price of the sin for the world. There's a song that was written by Casting Crowns. These are some of the words in that song. It says, the only scars in heaven won't belong to me and you. The only scars in heaven will be on the hands of the one who holds us now. Those scars will be on our Lord and our Savior and our King. They'll be on the hands and feet of Jesus. See, paying for the sins of the world left these lasting scars on Jesus. Just let that sink in for a moment. They listened to Jesus' words. 
They came close to him. They, they saw those scars and they, they touched it. Can, can you imagine being there and being able to do that? To tangibly and physically be able to see and feel exactly what Jesus did for you. This was beyond anything that they could comprehend. Is your minds were not able to fully process what was happening. I imagine uncontrollable tears that was falling down from their faces, thinking to themselves, my God, my God, thank you. How, how is this possible? Luke chapter 24, verses 41 through 43. It says, still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. And he asked them, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of fish, and he ate it as they watched. I mean, as this emotional experience was happening for them, being in complete shock and awestruck wonder that Jesus, who they saw crucified and died, was standing before them. That this was no dream, this was no fairy tale, but it was really Jesus. And as they were rejoicing, Jesus says, I'm hungry. I mean, this reunion is great, but I am starved. Now, whether Jesus did this to prove that he had a real body or if he was really hungry, it was probably to normalize the moment for everyone. So I believe this means that we're going to eat when we get to heaven. Amen? So they gave Jesus some fish and chips and watched him eat it with joy. Well, as things settled down, Jesus wanted to explain everything to them that had taken place according to the scriptures. So he reminded them what he taught them previously in Luke 24, verse 44. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. See, in a nutshell, Jesus was telling them that the, in the Old Testament, he was concealed. But in the New Testament, he would be revealed. See, the coming Christ was proclaimed in Genesis, Isaiah, Zechariah, and the Psalms, to name a few places. And if you think about the entirety of the Word of God, from Genesis chapter 2 all the way through Revelation, is God's redemption story. And the Son of God is the main character, while God the Father is the director. This is at least the second time that Jesus is sharing with his disciples this pivotal information with his followers. But this time he's sharing it, it's different. It's having more validity to him because he had already risen from the dead. See, it's one thing when someone tries to teach you something that hasn't happened yet, but then when they do the unbelievable, now you're going to pay closer attention. Because Jesus had told them, I will have to be killed and I will rise again. And now as he's risen again, he revisits that story. See, Jesus is doing something here that I want you to, to watch and take in. Jesus is preparing them. So he's making sure that they know the truth. He's making sure that they're educated, that they will go back and search him through the scriptures, that since they're eyewitnesses, that they will truly believe and have a deeper faith. Because it was extremely important. Because everything that was written about the Messiah was all coming to pass. And so while Jesus is teaching and revisited all of this to them, Jesus decided to do something even further. He decided that he would go deeper and reveal more of the scriptures to them by giving them illumination of what he was trying to tell them in verse 45. Listen to this. It says, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations, 
beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. See, these men and women that Jesus is addressing, they would be the main witnesses of his resurrection. So it's very important as Jesus communicates all this truth. Like, it's important that they all grasp this. It's important that they're all on the same page. Because Jesus is leaving. I liken it as Jesus is handing the baton off. He's saying, continue what I started. And so in order for them to do this, they need to have the entirety of the truth. They needed the illumination. So Jesus opened up their mind that they could have a deeper understanding of Scripture. And this was very profitable meaning that Jesus had with them. And they were all blessed to hear the depths of the Scripture and understand it. But... In all of this that was going on so good, there was one problem. One of the apostles was missing. He wasn't there as Jesus was illuminating their mind, sharing all of this vital information for them. And the person that was missing was Thomas. They tried to give him a recap of everything that Jesus said and explain the scriptures to him like Jesus did. And they also told Thomas how Jesus just appeared out of nowhere and that they thought he was a ghost. That Jesus showed them that he was no ghost, but he was real. That he was flesh and blood. But no matter how convincing they were trying to be, Thomas refused to believe their report about Jesus. John chapter 20, verse 25 said this. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands and put my fingers on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. So what Thomas was really saying is, I'm from Missouri. You will have to show me. I, I got to see this with my own eyes before I believe. This is how he got the nickname Doubting Thomas. But what I want you to know is that this is not an indictment on Thomas' spirituality. That he was a strong man of faith. That he was a strong man of godly character. In fact, if you look in the scriptures with Thomas, Thomas was one of the people who was prepared to die for Jesus. That his faith was strong. But he just needed to see this for himself. Probably because it all sounded just too good to be true. Well, Thomas would not have a whole lot of time to wait and be patient. That he wouldn't have to wait too long before he would have his own encounter himself. In verse 26, it says, A week later, the disciples were together again indoors, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Apparently, Jesus didn't like knocking or using the doors. I mean, every time he comes in, he's just appearing. I mean, I think Jesus came among them this time specifically for Thomas. Because it would be vital for all of them to be one, on one accord according to their faith. Because again, Jesus is going to be passing off the baton. So all of them need to be prepared. All of them need to believe because they're going to be the ones that's going to go out to share this good news. Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Then reach out your hand and put it in my side. Jesus says, stop your doubting and believe. Jesus chose to show Thomas his nail-pierced hands and the hole in his side. It was the doubting apostle that got to see this information, not only to look at his scars, but also to touch them. So can you imagine how much faith that built in, in Thomas? 
how everything that they were telling him, he was now able to see for himself. Jesus went this extra mile because Thomas needed this moment for Jesus to deliver this truth to him. Well, after Thomas saw Jesus' scars with his own eyes and touched him with his own hands, he had an incredible response in verse 28. It says, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, do you now believe? Blessed and happy, spiritually secure and favored by God are those who did not see me and yet believed in me. There's a lot that's going on in this verse. First, we see Thomas actually acknowledges Jesus as God. Not just as Jesus, not just as rabbi, not just as teacher, but God. And notice something else. Jesus didn't stop him. He didn't try to correct Thomas because Thomas' theology was perfect. I believe he too in this time was given illumination and knew that Jesus was truly the Son of God. And then Jesus says, because you have seen me with your own eyes, you now believe, which is fine. But listen to this. But blessed are the ones who have not seen me, but still choose to believe. Here Jesus is talking about us. None of us have seen Jesus We've read about him. We've heard testimonies about him. We've had our own spiritual encounter with Jesus, but we've never seen him physically. So Jesus says we are blessed and favored by God. See, God is so purposeful with this story because God knew that today that I would be preaching it. And he wants to use this story to deepen our faith in him. Why? Because our faith pleases God. Listen to Hebrews 11.6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to walk with God and please him. For whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. See, church, our faith is so important to God that without it, we can't walk with him, nor can we please him. See, when we think about our salvation, we are saved by grace. But that grace can only be given when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Think about that. We're saved by grace. But absent of faith in Jesus Christ, that grace can't be applied to our sin. See, we can never earn our own salvation. It had to be given by God. That's the grace. Our part is the faith. And once we have the faith that we believe in Jesus Christ, then the grace, God's unmerited favor, giving us something that we don't deserve, can be applied to our lives. See, from the time that the New Testament was written, it was done so by his disciples because they were all eyewitnesses to all that, that was said about Jesus in the Gospels. I mean, I think it's extraordinary. As we're hearing these stories about Jesus, and it's coming from the pen of those who actually walk with Jesus. But what I want us to understand is there's a reason why these words have been written for our behalf. It's because we didn't get the opportunity to witness the open tomb ourselves. We didn't get to see the supernatural appearances where Jesus was just popping into a room. But guess what? We still believe all this happened according to God's word. And that's the idea. That we can look at God's word and go, God, even though I might not understand all of it, I believe it's true. I believe, God, that you wrote it and it's perfect. And God, I believe as I draw closer to you, like you did with your disciples, you can give me an illumination for your word. That you can give me a deeper understanding of it. 
that, God, I can have an encounter with you that's almost just like I saw you face to face. Listen to John 20, verse 31. It says, but these have been written so that you may believe with a deep abiding trust that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, the Son of God. And that by believing and trusting in and relying on him, you may have life in his name. See, after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he was on the earth for 40 days. And during this time, he revealed himself to over 500 people. But now, the time for his physical departure from the earth had come. Jesus spent his final moments with his 11 apostles. And Jesus spoke these profound words to them. And he's also speaking them to us in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus says this, All authority, all power and absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, Help them, help them learn of me and obey my words. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Reminding you with you that perpetually, regardless of circumstances, on, on every occasion, even to the end of this age. The disciples now had their marching orders from their Lord and their Savior. And guess what? We have our marching orders as well. This is called the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations. But church, guess what? We can't go make something that we're not. How can we go make a disciple if we're not one ourselves? We can only make what we are. And this is why we do what we do at Powerhouse Church, so that every person here can become a fully committed and devoted disciple of Jesus. This is why the word is deep. This is why we have Bible study on Tuesday night. This is why we have our Hour of Power prayer on Wednesday night. This is why we have our women's and our men's discipleship groups. This is why we go out to Sunset Park and, and evangelize and love on those who are homeless and broken and destitute. Everything here is designed so that you will become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Not just a person who comes on Sunday, comes back next Sunday. We want you to be everything that God is calling you to be. And this is why I continue each and every Sunday is talk about having spiritual disciplines in, our, in your lives. Talk about the importance of you breaking open God's word for yourself and reading and applying to your life what it says by you having your own personal Bible study, your own personal prayer time, your own personal time was just you and the Lord and you're worshiping him in spirit and in truth. See, these are the things that a disciple, a disciple does because they know that Jesus Christ is their life and they're committed to giving him everything, not just a couple of hours on Sunday, but they're giving him everything because the disciple knows this, that their life is hidden in Christ, that they're now dead, and Christ is now living his life through them. Jesus proved to his followers that he has risen from the dead. He took the time to open up the scriptures to them, to explain all of these prophecies that were written about him and how he fulfilled them all. See, now that their faith has been restored, they were only missing one thing. But that one thing would be the whole thing. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses to tell people about me both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Jesus had to leave so that the helper, the Holy Spirit, would come 
and be God's power in their lives to accomplish all that Jesus was calling them to do. So the disciples were told to wait in an upper room until they received power from on high. See, church, what I want you to know is that the Holy Spirit is the Christian life. He is our teacher. He is our comforter. He is our strength. The Holy Spirit is the superpower for the follower of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. And after he said these things, he was caught up as they looked on. And a cloud took him out of their sight. While they were looking intently into the sky as he was going, two men in white clothing suddenly stood beside them who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will return in just a way as you have watched him go into heaven. Can you picture that? Jesus just lifting up on a cloud, leaving. And these two angels saying that he will return. There's an expectation for us to continue the work that Jesus has started. And that work is reconciling the world back to God. See, we do this by giving and sharing the truth in love and by being a true ambassador of Christ. So my question for us today, are you doing your part? Are you being conformed into the likeness of Christ? Are you telling the world about Jesus? Who will be in heaven because of you? Like who will be there because you share the good news to them. See, church, we have our marching orders of what God has called us to do. But the question is, will we do it? Because one day Jesus is going to return. He's going to have this expectation to be able to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I've entrusted you with certain gifts. There's an expectation that you're using these gifts for my glory, not your own. That there's an expectation that you bear fruit of repentance. As you've seen the scars in my hands and what I've done for you. If you truly love me, you'll do what I say. You will obey me and you will become everything that I have created you to be. See, church, we have to look at this story and look into our lives and say, how am I responding to this? How am I being honorable before God with the life I'm choosing to live? See, God knows that we're in the world, but he says, don't be of it. He says, deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Church, I promise you, when you choose to do that, God will take you on a beautiful journey. He will give you a beautiful life with him. It will be the most fulfilling encounter and experience of your life. Because you're doing what you were created to do. And that's bring God glory. So as we wind down this series, I hope a fire has been stirred up in you to say, Lord, from this day forward, I promise to give you all of me. So may my life be less about me, God, and all about you. That I'm going to have these spiritual disciplines in my life. Because, God, I know that I can't go out and make something that I'm not. That it's the expectation that every person who accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that there's a transformative work that's happened in, in their lives by the power of God's Spirit. That we should be changing, becoming more like Jesus 
more holy, more righteous, and less like our old selves. See, all things are possible for those who believe. And so the word was printed to that, presented to you today so you would truly believe. So that you wouldn't have any unbelief, that you would walk by faith and not by sight. That you would entrust the Lord with your few days that you have on this earth. We will leave this place sooner than we think. Our time is shorter than we think. So I'm asking you today, will you give the Lord the rest of your time here? Would you make him your main priority of everything that you do? That the words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart will always be acceptable in his sight? Will he be your Lord, your strength, and your redeemer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. That, God, you showed us the depth of your love when you sent your only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. And, God, we thank you that he didn't just die, but he also rose from the dead. God, we thank you that we can revisit the scriptures today to see that all that Jesus did in these 40 days before he was caught up to heaven. Lord, let it be a reminder to us that there is a call to action for every person who names Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so, Father, we just pray for a fresh filling of your spirit. That, God, that we would reconcile in our hearts and minds, that we would give you everything, that we would be a true ambassador of Christ. So, Father, I pray you do your work in us, that we too would become the righteousness of Jesus Christ in all that we do. So, Lord, we bless your name. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And may from this day forward, we don't just thank you with our lips, but we choose to thank you with our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to move to a time of communion. something that we do every Sunday here at Powerhouse Church to just remember what Jesus has done for us. That it's sad in a sense that when he took it with his disciples that it meant his impending death. But Jesus didn't just look to Friday, he also looked to Sunday when he would be raised from the dead. And so we can take this as a proclamation that he has defeated death. And that these are the elements that were given so that we may have life eternal. That Jesus took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body that was given for you. So as we think about our Lord Jesus and the breaking of his body for us, let's take and let's eat together. Likewise, he also took wine. He says, this is the new covenant in my blood that will be spilled for you. He also said, let every man examine himself. Let him not take it in an unhonorable way. Church, this is why we must live a life of confession, a life of repentance. Because God says he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness if we confess. So, Lord, we just confess right now in ways that we failed you. That, God, that if we've committed any willful sin, Lord, we ask for forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, that you died for our sins. And so us choosing to willfully walk in it is it's disrespectful, Lord, for what you've done. So, Father, as we reconcile and And think about the great sacrifice you made and your blood being poured out for us. We choose, Lord, to walk in righteousness. And we say thank you, Lord Jesus, for spilling your blood for us. So as we give thanksgiving to the Lord, let's take and let's drink together.
Father, we thank you for your body and for your blood. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our Messiah, our risen Savior. But we also thank you that you're also Jehovah Rapha, our healer. So, Father, we thank you that you are a healer. And we just pray right now of everyone here or watching online who has a spirit of infirmity, God, we just pray divine healing in Jesus' name. We decree and declare from the crown of each head to the sole of their feet, whatever is crooked, whatever is broken, whatever is not right, we command healing right now in Jesus' name. God, we thank you that all things are possible for those who believe. We just, even if we have a measure of faith the size of a mustard seed, to God, that you can heal. So, Lord, we ask that you would take what's crooked and make it straight, what's made broken and made whole. God, we thank you so much that not only do you inhabit the praise of your people, God, that you are here and near, Lord, and you're attentive to our prayers. So, God, we thank you that no prayer ever falls to the wayside without you hearing. So, God, we thank you that it's your will, God, for us to be whole. So, Father, we thank you right now that you're healing in this place, that you're touching God and moving, Lord, in our midst, and we say thank you. God, we also pray for divine healing, Lord, over marriages. That, Lord, what a, what a tough, tough relationship. So, God, we just pray a spirit of peace and joy and healing and reconciliation, Lord, over every marriage. God, we pray that the husband and wife, God, would be peacemakers. God, we pray that they would not go to bed angry, but they would resolve issues, Lord. Your word says love suffers long. So, Father, through the hardships and the difficulties that marriage has, may the husband, may the wife be willing to suffer long. Lord Jesus, would you be the centerpiece of every marriage? Holy Spirit, will you help them, Lord, to navigate themselves back to you if they've gone astray? Father, we pray for friendships that have been broken or fractured or damaged, that you would bring divine healing, Lord. Father, we pray over the prodigal son or daughter. We pray for parents with their children, God, that you would just bring wholeness, Lord, and a unity in the spirit and a bond of peace. That, God, that you would protect those who are away. Those, God, who are outside of your will, Lord, would you keep them safe? And, Lord, would you bring them home? God, we pray over every person that's here and watching online who's out of fellowship, God. Would you bring them back, Lord, to a fellowship with you? Whether it's here, powerhouse, or somewhere else, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they get connected to the body of Christ. God, we also pray for financial healing. Lord, we just rebuke the spirit of lack in Jesus' name. And God, and for those, Lord, who are honorable before you when it comes to finances, we pray a blessing over them. We pray, God, that you will rebuke the devourer from taking. And God, we pray that what's broken in our life, God, that you would supernaturally bring healing to. God, we pray that you would return to them what the locusts have taken away from them, Lord. And that you would open up the windows of heaven, Lord, and pour them out a blessing. God, we thank you that the earth and the fullness thereof belongs to you. And so, God, we thank you that you are our provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. So, Lord, would you provide for those who are in need? That your word promises, Lord, that you would provide for our needs. And so, Lord, we thank you right now that you're bringing healing, Lord, to the finances of those who are here and watching online. And so, God, we give you the praise and glory and honor on the front end, Lord. And we will walk by faith, Lord until you make all things right in our lives. So, Lord, we thank you so much for your love, your kindness, Lord, and for the word that was given today. May it find fertile ground, Lord, in the hearts and souls of those who've heard. And, God, may it transform their lives as they apply this truth to their lives. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a round of clap. Amazing. Word from the Lord today. Well, again, if you are new here at Powerhouse Church, we would love for you to fill out that Connect card so you can know what we have going on over the week. This Saturday, we are going out to Sunset Park to give back to the homeless and to do that evangelism and the Great Commission. 
So if you are available, we would love for you to join us. Also, if you're online and have been watching, you can also join us on our Bible studies at 6.30 on Tuesday nights. And again, Hour of Power at 8 p 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Wednesdays. And our next Experiencing God Discipleship, every usually it's every first Saturday this Coming Saturday, it'll be on May 11th instead of May 4th for the second week of May instead of the first week. And if you're already a partner here at Powerhouse, we want to say thank you. Some ways to give is at powerhousechurchlv.com on our website. You can find out through Zelle, Cash App, everything in order to partner with us and continue to do what God has put on our hearts to do to build his kingdom. So again, be blessed and we'll see you next Sunday.